Welcome to US CG360, I'm Ginger Chang. Our feature today takes us into the forested hills of western Pennsylvania to meet an eccentric couple, Ted and Kathy Carnes, who are off the gridders. To live off the grid means being able to power self-sustainably from the sun, wind, and water without connecting to the national energy grid system. It's interesting these people have chosen this pioneering lifestyle since according to the World Bank, there are about 1.7 million people on the planet who live off the grid, but most of them not by choice. However, America's antiquity power grid has been called into question if it can handle today's increasing energy demands. Thus, being disconnected from the grid system is an alternative solution to the flopping financial markets, the rocketing energy prices, the quest for freedom and environmental conservation. This frontier lifestyle doesn't mean these individuals are living in the Stone Age, as we will soon find out at Ted and Kathy's home, the Stone Camp. Throughout history, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania has been the home of the United States steel industry, the Pirates baseball team, as well as a booming economy. But while such attractions have drawn many people from all over the world towards the city, there is a couple nearby who have instead sought out a simpler lifestyle, one off the power grid in the local forest near the city. Yeah, my name's Teddy Carnes. I've lived up here off grid at the Stone Camp for 38 years. I've always had uh, an affinity for nature, a love of nature, and a love of solitude. My name's Kathy Carnes. Since maybe high school, had an interest in living a simple life, interested in people that lived like pioneers. Teddy's always cared about wildlife. He never wanted to throw anything away. He, uh, he wanted to keep everything and use it. He liked the outdoors. He was a Cub Scout and Boy Scout. He made his eagle, and he wanted to live out here in the mountains. When I was 19 years old, I happened to have been hiking up here because it's adjacent to our property, and the window was broken. And so I crawled through the window, and I just looked around and said, I want to live here. So we talked to the people that had the stone camp up there. They weren't using it and they agreed to rent it to Teddy for a certain amount. Well, the Stone Camp, according to the state, is the most isolated dwelling in the whole southwest division of Pennsylvania. So you can't get out into the mountains, into the forest, any further than this. And this was built by my great-grandfather and his uh, sons in 1926. But he had sold this little piece of property to some people in the city as a hunting camp. They would come up and go hunting. They never could get electricity because it's up too far. Then, it, you know, I moved in. Mm -hmm. Many years, very, very primitive, just a degree above camping. This area here is, has a lot of summer homes that had no plumbing, had outhouses, and that just intrigued me that people could live so simply. And I think that's one reason why Teddy and I became friends and we've been together this long, because it's something that we both have wanted to do. It was an ideal situation. People thought I was nuts back in those days. Now everybody's envious. Father, we thank you for this food. For home, for comfort, and all things good. For wind and rain and sun above. And most of all, for those we love. Amen. Amen. But the thing that I've noticed is this acceleration, people going faster, driving faster. Bottles, tin, aluminum, paper, plastic, those things can be recycled and not everybody does it. They were interviewing the governor of Pennsylvania and the governor, he said, we're not going to reuse paper clips and cut our notepads in half to save paper. We want money. And how are we going to get money? We're going to open up our common wealth to gas drillers.
Unhappy with what they saw in society, Teddy and Kathy developed their own self-sustaining lifestyle based on nature's principles, such as zero waste and conservation. What, what inspired me to you know, pursue zero waste is finding a bird's nest right out here that was made of my own hair. And then 14 years later, I was down to what do you do with a cigarette butt? For the past at least 20 years, all of the kitchen waste, that, that never leaves this house. Coffee grounds are uh, some of the Red Worm's favorite food, the gourmet dinner. And the brown filters are also biodegradable. And now from here, we take this all down into the greenhouse. It's turned into the fertilizer, it goes back into the garden, boosts the crop yield, what we eat comes back and it just keeps going in a circle. In my practice of zero waste, the main thing is to see that every end has another beginning, another step to take. We wash out all plastic bags, all, anything that we bring in here that has food. So when I'm doing dishes or he's doing dishes, it's not just the plates and pots and pans. So sometimes if this plastic is, is really bad and dirty, it gets the first dish water. That's how important it is to, for us to, you know, clean these things. We wash it, we dry it, and then it's sorted. Uh, synthetic wine corks, plastic lids, candle tins, bottles, tin, metal, a lot of that can be recycled. The, the very rinse water does not get poured down the drain. It has no phosphates, it has no soap in it. It's taken right out into the greenhouse and released into the house. Then the wash water is poured through a stainless steel screen filter to get out the particulates. And then that goes down and goes through 11 filters. And then is released in the center of the outside compost. So this is ethanol 190 proof. This is made from waste sugar from a bakery that would have ended up in a landfill. And if it cannot be recycled, we have a, we store it. Beer caps. There's a man in Texas who will pay for the shipping for these lids as concrete reinforcement. We have sheds, we have containers, we put it away somewhere until it becomes useful in another way. Disposability should not be practiced. And if it was eliminated, many problems would be solved that appear to have no relationship to that. Okay. So look at this beautiful building block, lightweight. This contains one full year of plastic wrap, washed, placed in, dried, placed in a garbage bag, put in a garbage compactor, to make this block an alternative to straw bale construction. The majority of my building blocks will be put in a, a future project, an ice house wall, that will be filled with chip styrofoam and several of these blocks, and they'll then compact that styrofoam and serve as insulation. I taught him as much as I could. <laughs> he's a mechanic, he's a stonemason, he's a lumberjack. He's most anything you would want him to be. He made the statement to me when he got out of high school. He said, Dad, I'm glad you made me work. He says, my friends can't do anything. And he says, I can do any most anything I want to do. And which made me feel pretty good. Dad taught me like this essence or this arch archetype of creativity that carries over from masonry to mechanics to carpentry. And I don't know that he was conscious of it, but I later came to realize you can do anything if you know the approach to creativity. Over the years, Teddy used his sense of creativity to transform his home to stone camp. What was once an off-the-grid hunting camp is now an example of zero waste for many modern comforts. We're as isolated as you can possibly get in this state. 
But I have a flat screen TV. I'm online. We have every convenience that we want. But we, of necessity, had to culture a conserving mentality. The first electric system was hooking onto the car battery, throwing a wire through the window and hooking it to the TV. That was the first one. The second one, finding three solar panels at the flea market, hooking up three car batteries. It's evolved into an electric system that is so much of an overkill, has so much power, we don't even come close to using it. From this point, I can sort of tell the state of my batteries, the rate of charge. These are for the solar panels. That is for the wind. If we need to wash clothes or sweep the floor, we press this button. Then when we're done, we shut this, the AC down with a very small amount of solar panels and a very small windmill combined with a conserving mentality. You know, there's two things we can't have up here and one's an automatic dishwasher and an air conditioner because they use so much power. And knowing that we are self-sufficient that up here we do have some heavy storms in the winter time sometimes and three feet of snow and we hear the power's out in town or I'll go to work and people will say oh my power was out was your power out and then they'll look at me and laugh and I'm like no my power wasn't out. <laughs> we have an exercise bike as part of our hybrid system. When you're pedaling you're producing power. So I've had people come up here and say well it only produces this much it's not worth it. The truth is it may be not worth it, but if you're out there and you're cranking your own power, it's the state of mind that changes. It's ample. You know, I have everything. I, I don't abuse it. I don't get obsessed with it. I like to watch cartoons, you know? That's, that's, that's when I shut down. We do have some cell phones now, and we are connected to the internet, so that is one connection we have, and it costs uh, a little bit each month. We have property taxes here, besides the health insurance, I have a small car. Teddy and I talked about what would it take to be up here and be self-sufficient, so I left my job and then we found that we did need some kind of income. Uh, Teddy and I would do little odd jobs from friends and get compensated, and it was very hard work, and the compensation really wasn't worth it, and I almost got killed in an accident, and I realized I could make a lot better money, a lot easier if I went back to being a social worker, so then I, I did that and also because of one day wanting to be able to retire and have a little savings. But I know when I do retire and I'm here more, I can dedicate more to growing more of our own food. Teddy and I feel that our garden is approximately 4,000 square feet. This is a little herb garden that I started, lots and lots of cilantro, lots of dill. Uh, I have some basil going right there. And we do believe that we could probably grow all of our food if we were willing to eat a subsistence diet of dried beans and vegetables, whether they're dehydrated or canned or things like potatoes, onions. The prototype, uh, or is it Cadillac of self-sustainability? I don't know. But by doing things consciously to nature, you can be sustained. Living in isolation has, you know, tremendous advantages. Peace of mind. <coughs> to be able to walk outside and see the greenery in the wintertime, to see the snow, the privacy. It's a tapestry of change out there. When I walk out the door every day, it, it's like, what am I going to see? But sometimes I, I, I live in the middle of the woods, and so nature creeps in a lot. The, in and out, there's uh, insects. But 
so we've got the best of both worlds. We've got this, what everybody dreams of, and we can go out. The flea market. You can find anything you want, really, for pennies on the dollar. But the thing is, you can never have anything in your mind. You have to go there without thought and watch things manifest out of thin air. In my brain, has always been the stone camp in its perfect form. You go, maybe. Maybe. Come back. No, I got a backpack here. And for it to achieve that perfect ultimate form, it needs a reverse osmosis filter. These reverse osmosis water filters cost between four and seven hundred dollars. Like two or three. I found a Just brand one. new reverse osmosis filter for seven dollars. Oh, I got water jugs for spring water and a jar of bread and butter pickles. My favorite. <laughs> And oftentimes, I've heard these, a lot of people say, buy it now, because when I leave, it's going in a dumpster. So we're saving that end, and I, I'm giving these jugs a beginning, or I'm giving this, this a, a new beginning, another use. And Kathy and I all, every once in a while, get this need for culturing, so we say, well, let's go to Pittsburgh. Sometimes life up here is very difficult, and so sometimes it is nice to have another place to go to and not be here. We'll go to this museum, we'll go to this conservatory, and we'll go to the aviary. We get in there, we go to one thing, let's go out for dinner, have a social life. <laughs> Kathy and I, for a long time, made ex an extreme effort. Like if we went to Taco Bell, we would bring all of our effluent home, everything. We still do bring the plastics home. As far as people in town and what they're doing, I think everybody can do something. And it's not so much the recycling, the first thing is not creating it or finding a new use for it. But you sit there and you, you see people, you know, they'll grab, instead of one or two napkins, they'll grab 20 napkins, and then when they get up, there's 15 of them untouched, thrown in the, in the trash. You know, you get discouraged, and you see the pointlessness of it, but I, I don't want to drive myself crazy. So if we go to Eaton Park, I'll let my napkin there for them to dispose of. I'll let my straw. Next week, I might say, I'm not doing that anymore. It's the inner inner voice, you know, it'll speak to you and say, you know, Ted, it's not making you happy to leave it there. Did you eat all your pizza? We ate it all, we could have eaten more, and we took all of it. Okay, <laughs> you're going to recycle that. And so then the next time I, you know, I take it home. I do have hope for the future. But the most efficient way to teach people and to change people is through your being, not your doing. Don't try to change people. Be an example. Be a perfect example. People change by watching other people out of the corner of their eye. We pretty much have an open door policy in a lot of ways. As far as like drop-in company and all the company, a lot of them come in groups. These are old sliding glass door panes. My sister-in-law, she gave me the book that Teddy wrote and that piqued my interest. This has a purpose, I just have to find out what it is. The Stone Camp as a manifestation of a lifestyle has a very powerful presence. My in-laws actually told me about Teddy for quite some time and they suggested I really need to meet this guy. Spreads very efficiently word of mouth. 
We do feel that there have been thousands of people through the doors here, probably, he says three to five thousand, I don't know. We have a guest book someday, I'm going to start counting names. A request, can I come? I have never denied anyone the opportunity to come here, ever. I feel that the day I deny and say no, then my world will fall apart. But the one thing I do know, Kathy and I are making change. We are influencing people. I learned the concept of zero rate waste. I wash out my baggies. I recycle more. Yeah, and a lot of people in their minds, they think of going off grid and they, they create a great chasm. Stone Camp did start small and grew to what it is today. And so many times I get that question asked to me, you know, you know what can I do, what can I do? And I, I say, start small. This begins to flow like a river. I picked up a cheap little set of solar panels for 130 bucks. Get something like that. Make it exclusively. Charge your cell phone. So anybody could walk away with one idea. I'm not going to buy the disposable plates. Solar eating solar uh, generation of power. Really trying to minimize my footprint on what things I buy, considering the packaging. And if they started that idea, maybe after a while there would be a, the second idea. Uh, secondly, I'm going to save a lot of water when I'm taking a shower. I'm not going to just let the water run in. Famous environmentalist. He made this statement, you know, everybody's worried about what kind of earth are we going to leave our children? And he said, that's not the question. What kind of children are we going to leave our Earth? If even one-tenth of the United States population would be as conscientious as my son, I don't think we'd have the worries that we have today. Reduce consumption, power consumption. Just look at what are they throwing away. Even Teddy and I need to look at our consumption. And it can be done. Anybody can do it. I'm telling you, if you combine a change of mind with alternative energy, it can be done with ease. No one knows exactly how many Americans live off the grid, but surprisingly, the number of people joining this movement is gaining momentum. According to Off the Gridder expert, Nick Rosen estimates there are some 750,000 Americans who are living off the grid already, with the trend growing 10% to 15% a year. Off the Gridders believe more people will be adopting their green lifestyle in the near future. But besides the numbers, one thing for sure that we learned from Kathy and Ted is that we all have a choice and a responsibility for our planet. We need to reconsider our daily habits, our culture on how we consume energy. I hope you enjoyed our program today, and I'll see you soon.